Okay, welcome everyone to the Analytic Mind podcast. I'm here today with Christine Greenleaf. And Christine uh, is currently working as the Director of Underwriting Analytics at Bright House Financial. I think I've got that right. And um, I think that there is a huge amount of interesting topics and uh, ideas that we can go into, especially in your area of um, analytical work, uh, because it's quite uh, unique. It's quite nuanced. And yeah, I really like diving into these types of topics and leveraging off your unique experience in, in uh, uh, this particular this particular area. So why don't I just throw it to you, Christine, you give us um, a, a bit better background in regards to your experience and, uh, you know, some of the interesting things that you're working on. Sure. Yeah, I'd love to. Right. So um, my background is actually, you know, I actually kind of love getting this question from younger folks, you know, maybe like college interns or folks just starting off in data analytics, because mm. I've had sort of a winding career path. So yeah. my background is a little bit more uh, foundationally actuarial or product management. I spent a long time doing both of those things for disability income and long-term care insurance. And you might not maybe see sort of like a one-to-one -one uh, skills transference for uh, data analytics, but it really gave me a solid foundation for being a data analyst, right? Because I, I spent quite mm -hmm. a bit of time doing pricing, modeling, valuation modeling um, on the actuarial side, and then on the product management side, working with um, the IT folks, you know, liaising between the business and the IT to kind of figure out requirements and solutioning for really complex problems and building those out. So, I mean, when you think about what a data analyst mm. does, all those processes are, are iterative and, you know, you go through testing. So learned how to be a really mm. strong descriptive and prescriptive modeler during that time as well. Mm -hmm. So that's really where I, where mm -hmm. I got my foundation. And when I was thinking back to, okay, well, when did I really truly become a data analyst? There's no like line in the sand. I can't really, I can't really point to when that was, but mm -hmm. um, at a certain point, I switched over to doing what I do now, which mm -hmm. is um, analysis for life underwriting. So I'm in the insurance business and um, it's a really interesting time to be in this field because I mean, I mean, I'll, I'll keep it fairly high level and, you know, details may be not specific to my company, just to protect my company, but, um, the industry mm -hmm. as a whole is doing very interesting things for life underwriting. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll say that anybody in my position sort of gets the, I, I think the coolest seat <laughs> um, because what we really want to do as an industry is make things um, more efficient, more streamlined, more user-friendly. And when I say user-friendly, what I'm talking about is those who are applying for life insurance while also protecting our risk and I'm talking about the universal R, so any company really, um, mm. and mortality risk, right? So we're talking about mortality risk. We're talking about longevity risk. How long is a policy going to stay on the books? And, um, you know, and all of this is being done while so many insurance companies have, um, not really completed the digital transformation. So we've got disparate data sources. A lot of mm. companies have data still on legacy systems. And mm. how do you combine taking that effort while also pairing it with wanting to give your customers um, a digital, easy, um, streamlined, you know, sort of experience. And mm. you also think about things like something like insurance, which people, th people don't think about insurance every day. Things that people think about every day are, you know, using their phone, 
getting an answer immediately, right? You know, mm-hmm. like, hey, Alexa, what you go? So um, it's not, it's something that we need to really balance the user experience with and what we're able to do while also, you know, the conversation is no longer what data is out there, the data, it's really what data is usable to us and how can we use it and how can we make it, how can we have it have the most impact to us, right? Mm. Yeah, it's really fascinating. A lot of things you touched on there, the, the, the very first one about how you moved into data and the analytic space, I, I think is more common than not. Um, oh, totally. Because, yeah. you know, so, so much of it has to do with the fact that um, there's this huge wave in the data space. The data is growing exponentially. The tools are getting so much better. And so I think anyone who has an analytical mind, <laughs> that's a, you know, that's yeah. actually why we call the podcast uh, as such, is, is, is sort of um, gravitates to that. Uh, you know, because even my background, I was, I was uh, really in, uh, uh, in finance, basically. But then when I was in finance, I was like, you know, this is basically just a data shop. You know, working right. in finance is just all about numbers. You know, everyone's just looking at screens. I mean, it is data, right? And I, I feel mm-hmm. like the rest of um, industry and all organizations are realizing that as well. Like it's it's really, you know, and insurance is, is, is exactly like that as well. It's just, 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 just all numbers at the end of the day. And uh, at, 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 you know, we, we, we need to be more empowered with the numbers, utilizing all the great tools that are available to us now. And, you know, if you can be sitting in the middle of that, you know, that's, there, there's a lot of value. There's a lot of value that you can generate for your organization. And there's a lot of value that you can generate for yourself too. Yeah, totally. And that's actually something too that I think is so important because it is all numbers. I mean, so much business is all numbers, but what we really need to do, and I actually consider myself a data evangelist and there's different people sort of define this term different ways. For me, what it's about is it's about education. So educating folks on how data can actually impact the business and drive business value. And then Mm -hmm. once those folks are impacted or once they're educated, I'm sorry, they actually go out and they're like, look at what data can do, right? So, you know, and Mm -hmm. it's, it's about taking small steps. So get your small wins in. It's okay, you don't need to do like these massive projects, you know, for our listeners who are maybe just starting out in their in their data journey, you can do these small wins. It doesn't matter if you don't have the latest, greatest tools, mm-hmm. your small wins and just get people to kind of buy into this, mm-hmm. this idea that data is impactful. And you'll have people mm-hmm. like on your side, believing it. And mm-hmm. basically, like, those people then are like, okay, cool. It's not just numbers. And they actually understand it. They understand the analytical portion. The issue comes when you don't do that education and you do, you do the analysis, you do all that work and you push something out and it is analytical, but there's not that education. And then your customers see it and they're like, okay, it's numbers. And they don't Mm. actually Mm. tie it back into the business. And it doesn't actually, it it doesn't actually, the value is not actually there. It's not actually, it doesn't create action like that. It does, the circle doesn't get completed. Yeah, I think that's a big one. Um, And and I've had, I've, I've, we've come to the same conclusion on a lot of conversations we've had on the podcast is, you know, you've got to showcase the value. It's not about just putting a report in someone in someone's in, in front of someone. It's about are you specifically answering something that they need and that they see as um, producing value for themselves, or you know, um, is it improving revenue goals, cost goals, uh, saving time, optimizing processes? You know, focus. Those are four really key pillars to any organization and creating value. And I think that if you can showcase those to the specific needs of, of an individual or a team, that's how you're going to get the most traction from, um, from, from what you're doing. And it sounds like, um, you know, you're of the, you're of the same view. Right. 
Um, now, specific to the insurance industry, what would be interesting uh, would be to just learn a little bit more about just some high level things that you can do, uh, that, that some high level you know, projects that can impact you know, what an insurance company does, or even just more broadly, like sort of financial. I think uh, that would be something that would be you know, good, good to cover just quickly. Yeah, sure. So um, I think from my industry and my profession in particular, um, I'll just like really, really high level from a risk and mortality perspective, we use data to help us identify potential anti-selection in cases um, for folks who apply. So we would use um, past claims and past underwriting experience in order to do that. Um, we could also, um, not on the applicant side, but on our side, look potentially at potential gaps in the underwriting standards. We would use data for that. Um, conversely, we also run what's called protective value studies. And um, when we do that, we're actually looking to identify um, anything that is like duplicative or on a marginal basis, doesn't actually provide us marginal risk value for uh, mortality and longevity. And therefore, maybe it's, you know, we can actually just say, okay, let's, let's give our customers a better experience and um, offer, them, offer them a better application process time. It's, I've seen it um, where we've cut down requirements. So, mm -hmm. you know, it used to be the days where um, a paramed would go to your home and have to perform an entire medical exam, take blood and urine. A lot of times companies now are doing accelerated underwriting. They don't, they don't require those things. Um, and maybe now we cut down on um, the length of time that it takes to actually underwrite in the process. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. those are the types of things that we're doing now with these protective value studies. Yeah, that's so fascinating. And one of the things that really sticks out to me is how many data points that an insurance company would have on a particular customer and then how you bring that all together, like how difficult that must be or how, from starting, you know, say you're just basically starting from, from scratch or, or starting with all these legacy systems, you know, what are some of the strategies, you know, could just, you know, from planning all the way to execution, how do you bring this, you know, how do you get this complexity down to a digestible form where your analysts can actually extract the data that they need for, for the insights for various stakeholders in the organization? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, it's, I'll say, I'll say like one thing. So when we're doing these protective value studies, it's not as, we don't have to worry too, too much about bringing disparate sources all together because generally what we want to look for or what we want to compare, and this has been my experiences at multiple companies, what we want to compare is um, sort of one data point against another. Does that make sense? So it's almost mm -hmm. like um, a scientific test. We have like a control group versus a, um, a test group. So, and I don't mean of cases. What I mean by that is we have a control, um, we have a control variable versus a non not a test variable. So because of that, mm -hmm. we can actually kind of discount a lot of factors. And in discounting a lot of factors, um, we don't have to worry about sort of bringing together a lot of disparate sources if they are in disparate places. 
Right. Okay. So, so from a, like, just from a conceptual point of view, um, you decide to focus on like the, uh, instead of taking into account every single variable that is out there for a particular uh, policy, you might just focus on the few that really matter. And, yes, and, and, exactly. and that, sim that, that yeah. simplifies the analytic, um, the, the, the analytic process or or the 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 end-to-end -end stack that you have to sort of put together to actually make a, a, a sort of product exactly element. exactly right. so are you are you quite heavily involved in um you know in terms of the the analysis part are you involved in the the entire process from getting the raw data setting it up in, into sort of an enterprise data model, then connecting that to a visualization tool and telling the story, or are you more focused, are you focused on, um, you know, one aspect of that? No, my team would mostly do all of it. Um, what we, so we are the, the analyst part of it. Um, okay. What we are not is the mortality experts. So we are not okay. like underwriters by any means. So right, we work right. very, very closely with um, what we call our mortality and insights team and they are okay. underwriters. So they are trained underwriters un right. under our underwriting division. Right, so are they like your um, uh, actress? Is it, is it, is it an, an actress or is it, what, what's Actuaries? the name for it? Actually, yeah. Uh, no, they're not. They're they're underwriters. Okay. So, okay. So yeah. And so, um, what would be so? How does it how how does it work internally in your team around uh, collaborating? So, um, collaborating with the business or or, or stakeholders. What are some of the in, you know what what are some of the strategies that you are finding are working uh, to make sure that you're delivering you know, quality data. Um, you know, products, data, data, data apps or data products for your stakeholders? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm probably unusual for your podcast guests because I'm a data analyst, not a data scientist. Um, mm -hmm. And so my team, myself and my team actually sit within the, the business. So our mm -hmm. team sits within the life new business and underwriting division. And we handle mm -hmm. uh, data analytics for that entire business unit, mm -hmm. but we are part of that business unit. Now, Bright House itself has a data science um, COE. That's All its right. own COE um, that's more technical and they mm -hmm. sit outside of the business. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, both of us, both of our teams work, I mean, our, our team is actually part of the business, but anytime um, either of our teams start project or a model or anything like that, you know, there's a business case or a problem statement, and we're making sure that we're educating our customers appropriately along the way, um, mm -hmm. just so that it's implemented and actually, you know, uh, ties back. But mm. um, I think that in terms of maturity, the data science team is more mature um, because right. when I came on was June of 2019 and that's sort of when the team kind, kind of switched to being more of a data analytics team. Um, right. It had previously been like a reporting team. So. Um, right. Do you feel like there's, there's an amalgamation of, or like there's a, there's a trend towards data science and data analysts, like sort of you becoming absolutely, one? Because I, you know, yes, yes. Cause that, that's so kind of like what I see, like, like mm -hmm. there's, you know, there's, there's, there's a real democratization I feel like around some of these more advanced analytical tools like yeah, everyone is you know, in a race in a race to make it more accessible yes absolutely and I, it's funny I took a few notes before we started chatting and I had the same thing written down is that 
I wouldn't even say as of right now, but I would say even maybe as of a year ago, I would define data analytics a certain way, like um, currently existing data and you are doing descriptive and prescriptive analytics only, and you are getting insights out of that currently existing data. That's data analytics. Data sa oh, and you have to be very, very business. You really need your business knowledge. And then data science is really innovative and predictive analytics, prescriptive analytics, but it's a lot more technical. And, you know, it's really blurring. The lines are really blurring. Um, and in general, I think that's a really good thing. And mm -hmm. to me, I think that it's, there are two things really driving that. The first is the increased usability of data. So usability and impact that it's having on businesses. So it's just the skills needed. There's a convergence of skills. Um, and then I think the second thing is just that um, there's this business knowledge that um, it, you, it, there was sort of used to be a separation where it was almost like business, or I'm sorry, um, data analysts were almost like internal consultants and data scientists were purely technical. And that really doesn't work anyway, that, anymore. That model doesn't work anymore. Um, especially because I think as companies have data analytics, I'm gonna say integrations that become more and more mature, mm. it, it, they won't be separate functions. It really should be ingrained in, this is just the way we do business, right? Mm. And mm. a data analyst, a data scientist, whatever it ends up becoming, <laughs> they'll be the expert yeah. modelers, they'll be the expert business intelligence specialists. Um, mm. But yeah, I, to me, I think it's a good thing. Yeah, it's kind of like, it's, it's just this continuation of this enormous wave around, around data. I think, you know, from my perspective, I look, I look at a couple of things um, that are, are pushing us towards that direction. First, uh, first of all, is that the companies that seem to be really winning are the ones where data is just, uh, it's a, they're immersed in data. It's just, it's, it's sort of like the core of their strategy. When you look at say Amazon, Facebook, um, Microsoft, Google, mm -hmm. I mean, they're all about data. They're all about AI. They're all about machine learning, et cetera. So they're winning. So everyone's waking up to the fact, well, like if we want to win too, we've got to, we've got to be doing this. And I think also, um, you know, technology is a big one. I think that everything going to the cloud is making um, the integration or, or, the, or, the, or the ability to plug in these other technologies, these advanced analytics tools so much greater. And then with it, the realization of that, the investment has been going into making these tools even more democratized so that you're everyday analyst. And, and I think that's the exciting thing for uh, users who uh, have you know may, maybe picked up say a Power BI or a Tableau or a ClickView, you know I, I think the exciting thing in the next few years is you'll be able to start integrating machine learning models a lot easier, you know even AI models um, a, a lot easier because these tools I think are going to be modular and enable um, that sort of uh, integration. So yeah, I think I think we're sort of on the same wavelength there. I think it's uh, seriously exciting that, you know, even if you're a data analyst now, like, you know, you'll be able to call yourself a data scientist uh, if you really want to dive into some of these more niche applications of the technologies that are out there currently. Right, right. And that's, I tell my team that all the time, there's about half my team is learning Python right now and I'm there with them right. and I'm like, yeah, right. it's, it's the future, it's our long-term plan. I mean, I think that we should be doing, that's sort of the way that it's going. That's what we should be doing. We should be um, forward looking and I, I think it's a good mm. thing. Yeah, and I even I even think like down the stack as well. So that, that's sort of more the advanced analytics stuff. Like even some of the things that I've noticed of late is that some of these um, database technologies as well, 
um, one that comes to mind is Snowflake, which is um, getting a lot of um, publicity right now. Uh, they're actually making it easier to organize that side of things as well. So there's, you know, I, I, I think that we don't have to just put ourselves in a box anymore. We don't have to just be the visualization um, experts or the analysts or the report um, generators. You know, you can, you can actually do some much uh, larger scale things if you just apply yourself in some of these uh, other, other aspects of bringing a data solution um, to fruition. Yeah. Um, and so what are, what are some other, uh, well, oh, uh, just of interest, what are some of the um, interesting technologies that you are using and that you are seeing um, uh, you know, and, and you are, are being utilized successfully in, in what you're doing? Yeah, so um, unfortunately our team is fairly immature when it comes to that. So I, I likely don't have a great answer for you there. Um, but I will say that um, very broadly, what I think that the, the technology that companies should be implementing in the future just needs to be future ready for, mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna say yes, in the future, we want to be able to have, um, you know, ever expanding analytics, but it's more than that, right? So um, the landscape is going to continue to evolve and we, we wanna be able to be nimble to that. So that's sort of more, mm -hmm. more what that's about. And then in general, I'm just more of a fan of um, analytics tools that are open source. So that's sort mm -hmm. of my two, my two for what it's worth. <laughs> Interesting. And in, in general, with the insurance industry, do you feel like uh, the industry is forward thinking around da data or do you think that they are lagging a little bit in terms of uh, the advanced insights, the um, advanced analytics that can be done? Do you feel like uh, there, there is, where are you? Where do you feel the insurance industry is on their journey to being more immersed in data? Yeah, that's a great question. So, in general, if I had to like take a pulse check, um, I I think that there's a real want for. Um, for us to be there with the technology. Mm -hmm. The issue is that the insurance industry as a whole has a lot of legacy systems. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen it at all the companies I've worked at and um, I've even seen some, some systems that go back to like the fifties, the sixties, like it's, um. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, it's, so, um, Do you th is there, is there a reason for that? Do you think, is that because of the sort of business model where, you know, um, insurance is, uh, you know, a, a really a, a long-term game. And so it's not as easy to, you know, make huge investments up front because you just don't know what the outcome will be long term. Like, is, is, is there some sort of like business model reason for that? Yeah, I think that that's a great hypothesis. I think that even maybe two years ago, that hypothesis could likely hold some weight. But I do think that at this point, the value has been proven. Mm -hmm. Um I will say um, for the folks who are in the wearing the decision hats, you know, like mm. um, I think they get it. I think they get that in order to stay competitive, to stay um, in the game, they need to they need to be um, you know real about data mm. analytics. It's not going anywhere, you know. I mean, I think. Mm. Um, a, a while feels... back, there were like some data science teams and it's like, what are we going to have the data science team work on? But now it's yeah. like, no, like everyone needs a data science team. It's mm. basic at this point. Do you feel like there's a, um, 
there's a realization in some of the C-suite at, at these larger established insurance firms that the, you know there's there's a whole range of upstarts who are a sort of data first insurance type or digital first insurance companies like one one's called lemon i think that that just oh, ipo'd yeah. in, in the states for some crazy valuation um but you know they're they're, they're being built in with this immensely scalable online digital first model data you know they're using data at every turn so do you feel like there's a there's a bit of a wake-up call there to the to the incumbents that you know we need to be a lot more um savvy around this this particular area Yeah, you know, that's a good question. Um, my personal opinion is that those startups, they can go either way, right? Because um, they're built on these platforms that are cool. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes the value is in the platform. It's in the um, meaning it's in like the application system and the, like you said, it's all digital um, mm. and it seems it seems like um, a lot of the value might just be driven by um, the market thinking that some of the more established players are going to want to buy these guys out because they're they're That's going exactly to basically surpass I, instead yes. of having to sort of turn the turn the mothership around internally they can maybe just latch onto a, a newer and fresher brand that has a lot oh. of this stuff already implemented and is built up that way maybe maybe that is more. No, that's record. exactly where I was going. And, yeah. and the value is sort of built not just on, you know, the cool the, the brand, it's built on the technology of it. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know that it's necessarily threat to entry. I think it's more um, potential it's kind of keeping aware because it's like, oh, well, all right, well, what are they doing? Okay. Hmm. Right. So what are some of the other, what are some of the other interesting insights that you've got just more around collaborating with your internal team? I'm interested to know some of the successful things that you've, you've done within your, your, your team um, alongside the business. How, how, are you, how are you sort of deciding what to focus on? Um, how are you deciding what to prioritize in, in terms of your analytics initiatives? I think, you know, just giving us a bit of um, guidance around or giving the listeners a bit of guidance around how, how you do it um, might be able to, I think, improve everyone's decision-making around how they can uh, think about these sort of things and and also execute on them in their own environments. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, you, we've talked about how in the insurance industry, I really think that those at like the C-suite see it's important. Um, that doesn't mean that there's been full company mindset shift. And I mentioned that I'm like a data evangelist. I, I sort of pride myself on that. So um, I think it depends on where each listener is in their data journey, but I do go back to that sort of cultural mindset. That's really, you know, priority number one. So mm -hmm. um, anytime, you are working with the business, you want to make sure that they're, they fully buy into the importance of data and its potential impact on business value. So um, my approach, um, I can kind of break it down into two segments. Um, I sometimes refer to this as working with the initiated and the uninitiated. Um, the uninitiated have probably, most people, so they probably have heard the term big data and they probably know that data is being collected about them. 
but they would not know that, you know, data can really do anything for, for them for, or for the business that they work in. Um, and then the initiated know about big data. They know that data can have a massive potential impact on business value and they just don't know how to get from point A to point B. So they need help sort of connecting the dots. Mm -hmm. So I take two very different approaches with these two, these two mm -hmm. types of folks. Mm -hmm. With the uninitiated, I like to sort of um, give them a hook. So try to just convince them that data is cool, basically. Um, I usually tell them one of my favorite stories. It's not really a story, but I mean, it's, tr it's real. It's a true story. I usually mm -hmm. tell them one of my favorite um, things about data, I should say, one of my favorite facts, um, just to try to you know, get them interested, get them thinking. And um, it's about Netflix. I don't know, do you guys have the show um, Stranger Things? Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, great. Yeah. So it was it a hit over there? Uh, I think it was a hit everywhere. It's not it's not one of my personal favorites, but I Okay, well, well that's we fine. Do, we, well, do, we do watch a lot of Netflix. My and uh, my 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 four year old son probably watches the most. <laughs> he loves all his all his all his uh, all his kids shows on it. It's amazing. Yeah. Um. So Stranger Things was a huge hit here as yep. well, and mm -hmm. um, it was a hit among different people, people who loved all different genres. So people mm. who loved horror, people who loved romantic comedies, people who loved like nostalgic, you know, sort of movies and shows. So mm -hmm. what Netflix did, and a lot of people know that they have their proprietary algorithm that they use to come up with recommendations for people. But mm. what they actually do is they change the picture um, mm, yeah, of the, no, show, I, the show. I, I see that all the time. Yeah, they do that for all the shows. Yeah, so they change it. If you're more into horror, they make it a scary picture first behind mm. Stranger Things. If mm. you're if you watch more rom coms, they make it like the two teenage mm. boyfriend and girlfriend kind of gazing into each other's eyes. And if you're yeah. if you kind of watch a lot of like old movies, they make it the nostalgic thing. So I tell mm -hmm. people that if they're totally uninitiated and they're like, wow, how? I mean, they have like heads explode. They can't believe it. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a great story. And, and, and Netflix is an, that's just another example of data first company winning, right? There's, there's oh, just yeah. all of these, yeah. if you can, there's, there's so many examples like that. And, and the thing is, is that there's examples like this in every business. Every single oh, business yeah. has examples like this. It, it might not you know, mirror it exactly, but it, it rhymes. Like there's, there's optimizations and value-driven analysis that you can do that can, that can make a difference, you know? And, um, you know, they obviously worked as Google does the same on YouTube, you know, YouTube thumbnails sometimes change as well. Or, and sometimes um, I see, um, I've, I've read this, that some content producers on YouTube actually use different thumbnails to see which one works better. Um, and then they go with that, especially the, the the bigger content ones who've got millions of views, and they can sort of test out what people click more and things like that. So there's, you know, those are, those are those are very unique examples, but there, there is opportunities like that everywhere, absolutely mm -hmm. everywhere. If you can get hold of the data and you can build a sort of a system around a solution around, you know, being able to work out what works better and what what is a better decision versus what is not. Yeah. So there. Their initial reaction is like, wow, that's really cool. And then their the gears kind of start turning of like, mm. they're doing that to me. Like that's like I watch Netflix every day and they're doing that to me. But then I'm then I'm like, I'll j I let them sit with it for a little bit. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like, think about yeah. what we could use the data for for, you know. So then yeah. um for the initiated you know, that involves me working with them on something that is a small win. So mm -hmm. something that's like um, low complexity, a simple efficiency gain. So for them, um, maybe it's something that takes them like an hour a day, but I can automate like, or someone on my team can automate in like mm -hmm. half an hour. And it's, you know, it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, dashboards that we can build fairly simple, but it tells them valuable information and they go that, to that and they use that, um, you know, daily or weekly and it's valuable, actionable information to them, um, mm -hmm. models that are low complexity. So um, to them, but that's valuable. And, you know, making sure that we are making that educational connection with them, because again, it just becomes numbers otherwise. But, mm -hmm. you know, the important thing is that this mindset shift takes time. So these small wins, if you're mm -hmm. doing them and you're being consistent, just over time, it, it, it shifts. And then, you know, you get people talking like, oh, did you see what Chris's team did? Oh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Care about the Netflix thing? Oh, so yeah. No, I really, I really a like big that. Difference. And and one thing I'm I'm hearing is, and, and I, I've actually, you know, this has been something I've talked about and concluded from many discussions. It's the iterative process, which is I think the the best here. It's not like you have to come up with this enormous business plan, spend millions of dollars. You can you can just make a difference really quickly. Um, with some low lower cost and sort of no code no code tools that are that are, that are available now, um, and it's just about prototyping and then iterating from there. And then you know it's not like you have to all put a um, a report or a dashboard into production straight away. You can do a lot of the prototyping and a lot of testing before it then becomes the certified report. Um, and I th I think that is something that I like to really hammer on, um, you know, in a lot of these conversations because it it, it is sort of the the, the common denominator in a lot of the successful implementations. Um, and if you, and, and that's also a men mentality thing as well. It's, it's also a cultural thing that if, you know, it's, it, it also, uh, I don't, I don't use those words that much, but the agile, it's sort of like, it's more agile thinking, right? Like, it's like, you know, you don't have to go and do some $10 million IT project. It can be you know, a really low, you know, it really could just be, you know, a lot of it is just time, time and effort right. and learning and resources and iterating on what is possible. And then you can eventually work your way up to these, you know, tremendous, like these, these really interesting insights, like changing a thumbnail on a video gets more people to click on it. Um, you know, I bet you Netflix didn't think of that right at the start of their journey, you know, creating a, um, you know, an on-demand um, video service. Like, you know, these are the sort of things that you get to if you, as you just iterate and you build the systems and the processes and then you realize, wow, this data holds a lot more value than it, it did initially because, you know, all of a sudden we are getting to these incredibly niche insights that make a huge difference. And, and I honestly think that yeah. I sometimes think, um, getting back to Netflix, that they are unbeatable because of the insights that they have. They just well, have... right. And I would almost warn against doing something like setting up the infrastructure and then and or spending the money to set up the infrastructure to do analytics, because what's going to then happen is the analytics become the metric to measure against the capital spend. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to to kind of prove your mm. analytics ROI mm. as you're just ramping up in the beginning, right? So mm. you're almost better off doing these small, small wins, incremental iterating to prove the value of the analytics um, by measuring those metrics themselves rather mm. than the analytics. And then that way you actually have a business case justification and a business case, you know what you want it to look like when you're building out the proper infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And um, getting back to ROI, um, uh, in your sort of line of work, are you, it'd be interesting to know, are you having to, to produce an ROI number, you know, to, to sort of justify your, you know, the efforts of your team? And, and if you are, how are you sort of coming to that number so that you can sort of say to whoever you're reporting to or, or to your stakeholders, okay, from our efforts here, from all the time spent, from the in, in investment that we've made in some of the technology, we've, we've produced this sort, of, this sort of value. Is, this some, is that some sort of um, uh, reporting that you have to do yourself? Yeah, so we... Uh, um, because we're part of the business 
it's a it's a business unit overall. Um, so that's the way that that our team is sort of prioritized is any sort of capital expenditures that we would want to make are mm -hmm. weighed against the priority needs of other um, business units within our team. Right, right. And do you find it easy to come up with an ROI for an analytics project? Um, not necessarily. Yeah, no. it's, 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 I, I don't think I don't think I don't think the answer is a clean yes. But um, yeah, it'd be, it'd, it'd be interesting to think, you know, to to see if you if you you know, do you have a process in which you do try and come up with some sort of value metric? That's the, I guess that's tr what I'm trying to trying to understand. Is there is there uh, a process that you have that others might be able to leverage off to sort of say, okay, well, we think we're going to save you know, 50 hours of time a month here based on this reporting solution we're going to develop and that equals, you know, $10,000 or something, um, you know, and then the return on our investment is, is, is X. Like, is, is, it, is there some sort of process internally that you do around that? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, CBAs are much easier, but um, even still squishy. Right. Um, so... Sorry, listeners. <laughs> no, that's cool. That's cool. No, look, uh, we're, we're always just trying to, you know, I, I, on the podcast, we get, we always dive into some quite niche topics around, uh, around analytics. And, and I'm always um, trying to uh, leverage off, you know, what others are doing in all sorts of industries and seeing if we can sort of bring it all together and, and create this sort of like collective analytical mind around how things are done. And, and that's honestly, that particular question is not something that I've really dived into that much. So, you know, I think um, there's some value in, in, uh, in doing that, you know, because there, there is so much value that you can extract from analytics, but I think putting a number on the value is quite hard. Like, you know, it, it can, you know, as opposed to, you know, if you hire, uh, X number of salespeople you expect to, you know, get this much return, or if you spend that, this much on advertising or marketing, you know, there's a lot of ROI that is built into those decisions, but there isn't like sort of this framework built around that. I don't think yet in the analytics space, maybe there is, maybe there is, but it's not as clear. Right. Cut. But I, I the, agree the with you, but I, I think part of that sort of goes back to the point where, um, I don't know that the data analytics capability is fully matured at many mm. companies. So, you know, yeah. you gave the examples of like Google, Facebook, Amazon, and um, those are sort of the examples. Like, mm. um, I think a, lo in a lot of companies don't really have the data analytics um, sort of functionality matured en enough to to be able to fully do that. I, mm. Do you see what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, look, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I think, I think that there's, there's probably an opportunity there really. If, if you really think about it deeply, like, is there, is there a way to take requirements from, uh, you know, a business function or, or throughout an organization, throw it all together? You know, usually this is what a center of excellence would do, I would presume. Um, you know, well, this is what they can do. Maybe I wouldn't presume they would do, they are doing it, but this is, this is, this is the, this, this is the value that the a center of excellence could bring to an organization is taking all those requirements and then working out, okay, well, what, like putting a number, putting a, putting a, a number, then that enables you to rank, say, which, which you should prioritize versus which you shouldn't, which initiatives throughout the business you should, you should do that to. And I think, you know, if, if there's a framework that can be built around that, I think that, that, that could um, you know, really produce, um, uh, enable the effectiveness of your data strategies um, a, a lot better than than maybe sort of just, you know, um, everyone working on their pet projects. You know, that that um, you know that is um, yeah, just j just an idea. Now, um, Christine, I think we'll, we'll we'll round off shortly. What I want to do is just finish off with um, a final question, as in in, to, you know, in terms of what what are you most excited about in terms of uh, you know, the data and analytics space and, you know, from a personal perspective, but also just from a, um, you know, a broad perspective of, you know, where is, where are things going for the, 
um, insurance industry for just industry in general around um, data and analytics? I, I know we've already sort of touched on there's a huge wave happening. We both agree on that, but you know, is there any specific things that you're you're quite excited about? Yeah, sure. Um, from a personal point of view, what I'm most excited about, um, and you and I sort of already touched on this, is that um, data analysts, data scientists, those two fields are sort of converging. Um, I think that gives opportunities to, to folks who call themselves either title. So I think it's a, a great mm -hmm. thing. I think um, there's a learning opportunities there. There's career opportunities there. Um, I think, um, I don't know. I think it's an exciting, an exciting thing. So I think it's mm -hmm. a, a I'm mostly, I, I really like to learn. So I'm mostly excited about the learning opportunities. So, so I mm. think that's, that's cool just personally. Um, and I really love what I do. So, so mm. I'm happy. Um, I think that's so common in the, in the analytical sphere because, you know, this, this so, technology changes so fast. So if you don't like learning, it's hard to keep, keep up with um, all of the new and interesting things that, that are coming on stream. Yeah. And um, in terms of the insurance industry, I think that being in the data space in the insurance industry, I mean, is so it's a really exciting time right now. Um, there's, um, you know, I, I, I just finished my MBA about a year ago and um, we, I took a course on, um, healthcare and we learned about um, electronic health records. And one of the things that life insurance companies now are looking to do is to potentially utilize electronic health records in underwriting. So, mm -hmm. I mean, just to be in the data space and to be, um, you know, potentially able to work with that. Um, mm in the next, I'm going to say in the next few years is, is really mm. exciting as well. Mm. I, I've definitely um, heard that t sort of the telemedicine, you know, obviously COVID's really changed that space up a lot and probably accelerated a lot of the initiatives in the, in the digital space. So yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. It's really, really quite exciting. The, um, the, the, the other, one of the other things you mentioned about the convergence of data scientists and data analysts, I, you know, there, there's a, there's, you know, just building on that, I feel, I feel like there's this, this opportunity of being a data generalist, you know, I think in the yeah. past, like everyone was in their silos where you had IT and then you had the database specialist, the ETL specialist, you had everyone in the business who was using Excel and PowerPoint, but the, the tools are just so user friendly now. Like if you access some of the latest tools, like that have literally only been around for a few years there's no reason why you can't build something end to end. Like there, there is literally no reason why you couldn't use a cloud-based database, then use some of the low code ETL tools, like even just like Power Query, which is in Power BI or Alteryx, mm -hmm. then using Power BI or, or Tableau. Um, you know, I mean, just with those tools alone, there's just so much that you can do. And, and, and then I'm sure there's going to be a lot more, there is some, you know, re really, um, um, there's some initial plugin like machine learning and AI type capabilities to these tools as well, but I would say they're they're really at the beginning stage beginning stages right now. Um, but it, there's no doubt that that that's going to come soon. So this 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 data generalist I think is a um, is a concept that could become you know quite mainstream. Maybe we should start it on this podcast. The data we should we should we, yeah, we, we should we name we should it. name something. Yeah, data generalist like. You know, there's just, you know, we, we don't need to be siloed anymore. I think that, you know, maybe the data scientists might get offended, but I think that um, that, that, that that is where it's going. And, and if you're at the forefront of that, there's just huge, huge opportunities for, for individuals and, and teams and organizations that really buy into it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you so much, Christine. Really, really yeah. enjoyed our chat and love. Thank loved you for hearing. having me. 
Yeah, real pleasure. And uh, really enjoyed um, hearing about your experiences and and uh, talking about uh, in the insurance industry and some of the some of the things that you have to deal with there. So, yeah, really um, really appreciate your time. And uh, you know, thanks for thanks for being on the call with us. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Um, now, I'll, now thanks everyone for tuning in, and uh, don't forget to subscribe to the Analytic Mind podcast. Um, plenty of um, historic and future discussions coming up um, just like this one with Christine. So don't forget to subscribe and also leave us your feedback as well. We always, uh, we always read it and, and like, um, like to hear from you. Um, and uh, lastly, we also put this up on our YouTube channel, the Enterprise DNA YouTube channel. So definitely check that out. Okay. Thanks everyone.